Welcome to the Health and Human Services Finance Division. Um, we are going to get started, and I know mem I know that folks are still picking up documents and coming into the room, but if folks could please stop uh, conversations and um, just proceed quietly, I think we can get started because we have a really important presentation, and we have a pretty packed agenda today, so I would really like us to get going, and uh, members are also filtering in, and... I'm not sure we have a quorum quite yet, but um, anyway, um, well, first we're going to start with a little presentation um, from the Attorney General's Task Force. Representative Lesh, if you have the first bill up, but we're going to do this presentation first, so maybe it'd be better just to find a seat if you can hang out here for a while. And so I'd like to um, call up... Um, Dr. Stephen Schandelmeyer and Ben Belzen from the Attorney General's office. If you would just want to come up together, I don't know how exactly you have this planned out. I just would leave that up to you. And um, as members may know, the, um, we're going to be hearing today some bills on uh, controlling pharmaceutical prices. But we have just had this report issued from the Minnesota Attorney General's Advisory Task Force on lowering pharmaceutical drug prices. And I have to say, I haven't read the complete, completely read the report, but I've been kind of slogging through it. There's a ton here, a lot of really good work and a ton of information. So um, we really appreciate the work of the um, task force and everyone who's been involved with it. And I know it's going to be a challenge to present this kind of briefly, but um, we'll just do our best. So Mr. Belson, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, first, thank you for uh, asking us to testify today. My name is Ben Belson. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office, and I was also involved in supporting Attorney General Allison's Drug Pricing Task Force. Real quick, I'm going to take 60 seconds to kind of talk background on the task force, then toss it to the real expert here, uh, Professor Schondelmeyer, to, uh, who is a member of the task force, to give a very quick summary of the task force and its 14 recommendations. So. Um, as I noted, I was one of the many persons in the Attorney General's office who supported the task force over the last year. The task force just released its 91-page report on February 19th. Um, and kind of what led to the task force was the Attorney General's office has brought a number of enforcement actions in the drug industry over the last few years, including um, a lawsuit against insulin manufacturers over their allegedly fraudulent pricing practices, um, price-fixing legislation against uh, more than 15 generic drug makers, uh, uh, cases against opioid manufacturers that involved alleged kickbacks. And what this uh, revealed was there was a need for a deeper look at the drug industry. And so this led Attorney General Ellison to create a 15-member task force in February 2019 with the goal of coming up with real, practical, and workable solutions to lower the skyrocketing cost of prescription drugs. Not only did the task force contain experts like Dr. Schondelmeyer, Dr. Schondelmeyer but also uh, doctors, nurses, patients, and bipartisan members of the Minnesota legislature, including Representative Lesh and Representative Hamilton, and Senators Jensen and Little. Um, the full task force met eight times. It had three working groups that met scores of additional time. It heard from <coughs> numerous medical practitioners, other experts, state officials, and members of the public. This resulted in a 91-page uh, report on the drug industry and some uh, significant causes and contributors to high drug prices, and the task force made 14 recommendations on how to lower high drug prices. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Shondemeyer to summarize the report and those recommendations. All so, right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vels, and welcome to the committee, Dr. Shondemeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Vels, for that summary. Uh, I'm here as an individual and as a member of the task force to describe the recommendations that were put together, uh, and I encourage uh, individuals to read the task force. Uh, both the recommendations as well as the detail behind it. First, before we jumped into throwing solutions to a problem, we identified what are the root causes of the issues we see in the pharmaceutical marketplace and the pricing practices and uh, what types of anti-competitive behaviors are out there that seem to be going um, unchecked or unchallenged and may need attention. And uh, we recognize, first of all, we believe in markets and we acknowledge that. But we also recognize that with respect to pharmaceuticals, we create a marketplace where we give the 
entrants when they come into the market a monopoly. And then we expect competition to work in a monopoly environment and you learn in economics that that doesn't work. Economic competition doesn't work well in a, a monopoly environment. So yes, we do want to reward innovation and we value that, but we also want to reward innovation in, in drug pricing and making affordable drugs available, not just drugs that sit on the shelf that people can't afford. Uh, so we uh, described the background conditions in the marketplace in the report, and again, I encourage people to read through that. But let me move to the recommendations. There are uh, 14 recommendations, and I won't go through all of those today, but I'll highlight some of those and then look forward to questions uh, from the committee. The first recommendation is that we recommended establishment of a, a prescription drug accountability commission, or it could be called an affordability commission, so that there is a process for oversight of drug prices that appear to be out of line with respect to market principles and market behaviors. And there is uh, HF4 is one proposal. There, there have been proposals uh, before the Minnesota legislature to develop such a a commission and um, it, first of all this would create a process to monitor drug prices and identify certain drugs that would be screened uh, then if certain drug prices either increase at a certain rate or come into the market at a very high rate that looks unreasonable by some definition then this would ask the manufacturer to provide evidence and provide documentation of exactly why is it that this price is uh, justified in the marketplace and uh, with appropriate justification, the matter would be over. If the commission feels like the justification is not adequate, then there are a number of remedies that uh, could be pursued and that we don't specify those remedies necessarily in this report, but depending on the pieces of legislation that bring a commission forward, that could be addressed. Uh, but it creates a process, again, of accountability. Why is it this drug costs $2.1 million? Or why is it this drug that costs $1,000 today costs $5,000 tomorrow? Uh, those kinds of jumps in a marketplace are not what we call a competitive market, uh, and they're not a functioning economic market. And so these, this commission would look at things that go beyond what would be a effective competitive economic marketplace. Uh, a second recommendation was to the degree that the federal government has uh, identified that importation could take place, that the state of Minnesota should work with the Secretary of HHS and the federal government and try to develop uh, importation within that context. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. The Trump administration has said and ask the FDA to develop procedures to allow importation and work with states on that. And if, if those procedures are established, we encourage Minnesota to talk with them and see if we could take uh, uh, advantage of that program. The third recommendation is that Minnesota should enact uh, drug price gouging legislation. Now, arguably, there is legislation on the books already in Minnesota that looks at price gouging in, in any market. Uh, and out uh, behaviors that are beyond certain uh, parameters. Uh, it probably does include drugs, but it's not clear that it does. So we felt like that uh, someone in the legislature should develop a proposal to determine what is price gouging. And it's kind of like, you know, you'll know it when you see it, but we can begin to put some parameters on that. And, and we're talking about here not just a 10% price increase, we're talking about $1,000 to $5,000 overnight. We're talking about drugs coming in the marketplace at uh, extremely high prices beyond what any individual uh, can afford as an individual. Uh, and so uh, we do um, recommend that the state have a process for challenging extremely high prices in the marketplace. And again, give a complete fair hearing to the uh, party charging that price to justify it and present evidence of that justification and then uh, a process for following up. Uh, we also just recommend that uh, Minnesota laws and statutes be reviewed for certain broad categories, anti-kickback activities, consumer fraud activities, and antitrust, and they be reviewed in the context of the marketing behaviors we see in the pharmaceutical 
marketplace to see are there additional ways that uh, uh, behaviors can be enforced with current um, regulations and statutes in the marketplace. Uh, next, we advocate there are a couple of programs that are in existence. These, these don't require new laws, don't require any change in legislation or even new enforcement, but simply implementation. There's a 340B program that the federal government established to provide uh, very favorable prices to entities that have government funding for the care of patients. And the prices they get, I've studied these prices, and they're about half of what the price normally is in the marketplace, and they're among the best discounted prices in the U.S. marketplace. And there are a number of entities that qualify for 340B program in Minnesota that don't participate in it, that don't take advantage of that. So we encourage that somewhere uh, within the state, perhaps, that we set up a technical assistance office to advise and encourage and stimulate the programs who could qualify for these uh, great discounts to be aware of them and participate in those programs and take advantage of them. And then Minnesota has for years operated a multi-state drug purchasing program or a bulk purchasing program. The uh, MMCAP Infuse is what it's known as today. It used to be the Minnesota Multi-State Purchasing Program. Most other states in the country take advantage of this program. Most other states in the country buy more drugs through this program than Minnesota does. So we encourage entities in Minnesota who can use uh, the multi-state purchasing program to be aware of it and take advantage of it and use resources we have. And again, a technical assi assistance would be useful here. Uh, and then finally, we recommend uh, two more broad areas. One, um, price transparency. Markets only work when you know the price. You, you don't know if a price is unreasonable or or reasonable if you don't know it. Uh, so first, uh, actions that will improve the transparency and pricing are critical. And then we encourage, the legislature last year passed an <coughs> oversight bill for pharmacy benefit managers to look at some of the practices in that marketplace that appear to be uh, challenging the market. And we encourage that uh, the Department of Commerce and others involved with implementing that legislation uh, do so uh, with all, all due haste and do, do appropriate um, regulation of the pharmacy benefit management market in the context of its impact on consumers and their access to pharmaceuticals. Um, with that, I thank you for your time. We would welcome questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Schondelmeyer. And again, thanks to everybody who worked on this report. Um, so we do have a pretty full agenda. I, I want to announce we have a quorum. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, if there are brief questions, I think we could take them. But I, I kind of want to move on to our first bill, which is directly related. House File 4 is one that, as you mentioned, is about the price gouging. Um, and so we do have uh, Representative Bierman. Quick question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Schondemeyer. Could you please comment on the last one, this number 14, supporting additional research into prescription drug pricing and drug benefits? And what is the type of research you think would be most helpful? Would it be to look at the way countries abroad do their drug pricing and, reg and regulation? Or what, what is the um, process or thoughts you have on how we could best dig into that issue more deeply? Dr. Schondelmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Beerman, and thank you for your service on the task force as well. Uh, I, I think the additional research, one thing that you mentioned certainly could be, that is study how other countries manage this process. Uh, and, and other countries do uh, have a marketplace and do have drugs in their market and they do have innovation, but they also approach this very differently. So that would be very useful. Second, I think one can study are there new behaviors taking place in the marketplace that are having anti-competitive effects? Uh, I describe this market as a lot like a whack-a-mole process, that things keep popping up every year that challenge the market. And if we simply pass legislation that outlaws whack-a-mole one, two, and three, next year we'll see four, five, six, and 28. Uh, and so simply passing laws to deal with the whack-a-mole issues isn't sufficient. We need to have a process to monitor the market as a whole and identify the new 
whack-a-moles that show up, basically. One quick follow-up, Madam Chair. Dr. John Mullick, could you also comment on the pricing of drugs that you spoke about previously in another venue about the increase in costs this very year? Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Beerman. I'll, I'll try to keep it quick, but I do track prices of drugs, all drugs on the market in the U.S. And just in the first six months of 2020, uh, we've seen 2,820 drugs increase their price. Uh, of those drugs that increased their price, uh, the vast majority, about 94 5 percent, increased faster than the general rate of inflation. And among those, there were 27 drugs that more than doubled in price just in January of 2020, just overnight in January of 2020, there were still prices that doubled. So even though as you read the report and you'll say, oh, that's the past behavior, now that everybody's watching drug prices, this won't happen again, yes, it will, and it has happened already in January. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if the two of you could stay around for a little while as we... Um, get through some of these bills and maybe we will have more. I, I mean, I think we could, we could definitely hear from Dr. Schondelmeyer for the entire hearing and ask a lot of questions because this is fascinating stuff and really complicated as we all know. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, uh, so I'm going to call up Representative Lesh with House File 4. And as I do, I just would like to comment to members and to the audience, these are bills that we have heard before. We heard them last year. We either, um, and this one in particular passed in, the, it was in part of our omnibus bill that passed out of this committee. I believe we also had an individual, we, we heard the bill. And so this bill is, I think substantially the same as it was last year. So I don't know that we're going to need a lot of, we have a number of testifiers um, to this bill and we're going to keep the testimony really brief because this has had a full discussion. And so our goal is we need, we have some uh, minor amending to do, I think, and then we're going to be moving this out. So. So welcome to the committee, Representative Lash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam, did you just want me to go ahead to the bill, Madam? Yes, if you could just briefly present the bill and remind members of, uh, of what we're... Oh, yes, I have to move the bill, don't I? So the chair moves House File 4 uh, to be recommended to Ways and Means. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Members, House File 4 is the anti-pharmaceutical price gouging bill. Uh, and this bill uh, was a... Uh, work uh, between myself and the Attorney General um, and the Attorney General came up with some great ideas about how we could do this and uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison um, I'm really pleased first of all that he has um, put such a such effort and resources behind getting this bill heard and getting the, the uh, issues in it considered because as you just heard from Dr. Schonelmeyer something's wrong um, and that, that phrase, something's wrong, goes directly to the bill itself because the bill prohibits unconscionable price increases in pharmaceutical. And those of us who don't know uh, what unconscionable really means and have to look it up, if you look it up, it means it's not right. All you have to do is, is listen to the testimony of those drug price increases that happen overnight as testified to by Dr. Schonemeyer and, and say to yourself, something ain't right, because it's not. We all know that. This isn't the natural uh, flow of the market. This isn't the invisible hand of the marketplace, unless it's the invisible hand of a marketplace punch you in the face when you need uh, pharmaceuticals that you rely on and that are essential to make you better or help you live. So that's what this bill does. It says if the drug is essential to you, to your health and for you to live, um, and if the price increase is unconscionable, then the Attorney General steps in and takes a look at it. Uh, there are many other people here who can testify far more uh, thoroughly uh, about some of the details, including um, the Assistant Attorney General here as well as, as Dr. Schonemeyer, but I wanted to, to uh, leave you with one thing. Uh, members, I'm a veteran of, uh, of many institutions. 
I spent uh, four years studying for seminary in the Catholic Church, a big old institution. I did 17 years with the city of St. Paul. I've been here at the state of Minnesota for 18 years, and I did eight years in the Army. And one thing I can tell you is that any time a bureaucracy or a system gets old and big, it gets more complex. And as it gets more complex, you end up with some anti-intuitive and, frankly, absurd results, just like with the pricing of pharmaceuticals right now. It's gotten so ridiculous and so complicated, given to such a long history of uh, pharma and the system itself. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are a part of the system. They are not the only cause of this, but they are a part of it, whereby it becomes nearly impossible to get anything other than, hey, something ain't right. So that's what this bill is about. It allows the Attorney General to stop in and examine that. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I would uh, leave it to my other testifiers. All right. Well, thank you, Representative Lesh. There is an amendment, uh, an A4 amendment, and I understand that's a technical amendment. Did you want that one moved? Yes, Madam Chair. All right. So the Chair would move the A4 amendment to get the bill in the shape in which the author would like it. And Representative Lesh, can you explain the technical amendment? Could I have research explain that, Madam Chair? Okay, I completely certainly. forgot. certainly, Mr. Chan. Uh, Madam Chair and members, all this does is it updates the underlying um, cor current law that the new language is amending. It's, it's a purely technical move because the action in the bill you know, has moved over to this current uh, session. Right. Okay. Now I remember, right. Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Representative Lesh. So any discussion to the A4 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails. And then we have another amendment, that the A5. And this is um, an amendment. Maybe, Mr. Berg, can you discuss this one? Madam Chair, the A5 amendment uh, appropriates the money to the Commissioner of Human Services that's necessary for this bill. If you look in your packets, there is a fiscal note uh, that is a new one from this year, but it looks very much the same as the one of last year, only one year down the road. Um, you'll see there are net costs at the Human Services Department of $31,000 in 21 and $36,000 a year in the tails. This amendment appropriates, it's a little, maybe a little unusual for members who are used to seeing our appropriations because normally our spreadsheet maps out federal participation against it and you only see one of those two numbers. This appropriates the full amount, and then it makes a note that we expect federal financial participation to offset our costs. And my understanding is that this bill will move from Ways and Means to the State Government Finance Committee to deal with the AG costs. Okay. So, okay with that, Representative Lesh? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. So we're just trying to line it up with the fiscal note. And... As Mr. Berg explained, we're, um, there are the AG requests costs in the bill to administer this, and we are moving the bill um, to Ways and Means, and presumably it will go to State Gov Finance so that they can deal with the Attorney General costs that are in the bill. So um, um, all, uh, any discussion on the A5? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails. Okay, so now we have some testifiers, and if we could keep that really brief, and uh, starting off with, um, yeah, we're going to ask people to stick to two minutes. We have uh, four people on the list here to testify. Mr. Belson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, my name is Ben Belson. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office, and I will be very brief because, as Madam Chair uh, <coughs> noted, this bill has already passed through all relevant House committees last year and was on the House floor but not enacted into law. So first, let me start by saying that the Attorney General's Office strongly supports HF4 and believes it would be an effective manner to prevent runaway drug prices in Minnesota. Further, as Dr. Schondelmeyer just testified, recommendation number three of the Attorney General's Drug Pricing Task Force uh, was to enact a price gouging statute such as HF4. So um, uh, I think that uh, from the Attorney General's position, this would be, uh, again, a very effective way to control high and exorbitant drug prices in Minnesota. HF4 prohibits charging an unconscionable price for essential prescription drugs, which include patented, off-patented, biologicals, and generic drugs that also <laughs> uh, meet certain other requirements. And as Representative uh, Lesh said, uh, if, if the law is violated and there is price gouging on, on drugs, it would be referred to the Attorney General's Office for Enforcement. And I also want to note um, that uh, HF4 is different than Maryland's law in some important manners, I um, mean, that applies 
only to drugs prescribed in Minnesota, sold in Minnesota, and sold to a Minnesota consumer DHS or a Minnesota health plan, which are small but very important uh, distinctions from, for example, Maryland's law. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those key points for members of the committee and uh, of course, I'll be around for any questions later or now. So. All right. Thank you very much. So next we have Aaron Ears Ardle, then Judy Cook, and then Sharon Lamberton, if you could be ready to come down. Welcome to the committee. Please just say your name for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. If you could keep it to two minutes, we would appreciate it. Uh, Chair Liebling and members of the committee, my name is Aaron Ears McArdle. My husband and I live in Anoka with our first grade son. I'm a fine art jeweler and metalsmith working out of my home studio, and I'm also a member of the Anoka Hennepin School Board. I'm sharing my story today to do my part in stopping unethical drug pricing. <coughs> Over 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with what is now called type 1 narcolepsy. There's only one medication, Zyrum, that comes close to keeping my symptoms under control. In 2007, the retail price of Zyrum, a liquid oral medication, was $2.04 per milliliter. In 2014, it was $19.40 a milliliter. Today, it's $29.69 per milliliter. At my dose, a 180 milliliter bottle lasts 10 days, bringing the annual retail price to $192,400.56. I'm fortunate to have prescription coverage that covers all but $35 per month of that cost, but I am just one of the lucky ones. There's no reason that Jazz Pharmaceuticals should be allowed to price gouge Zyra. As a treatment for a rare disease, this medicine was developed with our tax dollars through publicly funded research grants from the Food and Drug Administra Administration administered through the Office for Orphan Medical Products. There's no research and development debt to justify these egregious price increases. Medicine is a public good, but while Big Pharma spends money on lobbying and advertising, the public is paying for medicine twice, once through publicly funded research and again at the pharmacy. In the Netherlands and in many other countries where drug pricing is regulated, the annual retail price of Zyrum is less than a one-month supply in the United States, but it's the same medicine. This greed is unconscionable. Before I had access to Zyrum, I couldn't drive. I couldn't walk 100 yards without falling down from cataplexy. I couldn't take care of myself, and I had no idea how the rest of my life would go. Zyrum gave me back my life. Too many people with debilitating narcolepsy can't afford Zyrum. Too many insurance companies refuse to cover its high cost. So many people who need medications are suffering because corporations are price gouging the medicine we need to live. Drugs don't help people if we can't afford them. We need our elected officials to change the rules. Please support House File 4. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to testify. And we're going to hold off on questions if you can um, stay in case there are any for you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Judy Cook with Cook Girard Associates. I'm representing the Association for Accessible Medicines, which is uh, the trade association for generics and biosimilars. Um, I'm actually going to use my two minutes and go a little off script here. You know why we are opposed to House File 4, the triggers, unclear definitions, uh, constitutionality, private right of action, percentages. Um, as you know, more than 90% of drugs <coughs> are generics, and they're only 22% of the cost. You heard it, you're hearing in Mayo, at the Mayo, that generics are actually a good thing in the drug marketplace. Generic drugs have um, had three years of deflation, lower prices, and 36 cents of every dollar spent on a generic drug is what goes to the generic manufacturer. So the rest of that goes to the others in the supply chain. House File 4 is just one of many bills that is moving through the process. You heard the Attorney General's proposals. And we really encourage you to look at House File 4 and all the others at the overall impact on the generic marketplace. There are a number of bills, as I said, and I would hope that you don't want to disrupt the generic market, especially with the promise of biosimilars and the billions of dollars of potential savings that will come when they come to the market. So we oppose House File 4, and again, encourage you to consider the impact on generics. Your goal should be to reduce cost to consumers, both in terms of patient out-of-pocket, premiums, and state spend. And to that end, we want to work with you on that. And while I'm here, uh, Chair Liebling, I will just mention that on the next bill coming up, House File 1246, 
Um, with the amendment, the author's amendment that is coming, AAM has removed opposition to that bill. That is the drug price transparency bill. So I'll just mention that while I'm up here and I won't need to come back. But um, we do oppose House Bill 4, and, but want to work with everybody and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, Ms. Cook. If you would just hang around because we're holding questions until we get through the testifiers, uh, that would be great. Uh, Welcome to the committee. Hi, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Sharon Lamberton. I'm with Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America Trade Association in Washington, D.C. of 38 biopharmaceutical companies. I'm a nurse by training, and I'm proud that our industry has more than 56 medicines that have been approved this past year. And we have 7,000 medicines in the pipeline, a lot of hope for our patients for new cures and developments. We respectfully oppose HF4 today. I wanted to talk just briefly to lay out three points in context before talking about our opposition to this legislation that has good intent, but we believe it neglects to consider three important things. One is that the net prices of medications have grown just 0.3% in 2018 when you take out the negotiated discounts and rebates that are accounted for. Um, that are not accounted for, and that's, that's only 0.3%. Also, better use of medicines. If patients were to take medicines as prescribed and use them as, um, as needed, we could save the system over $213 billion in the United States annually. Um, and that is the most important thing we should be addressing here in this committee is insurance design. I think that's the real key because of the differences of insurance design. There's a lot of discounts and negotiations we've talked about that are not getting passed down to the patient at the point of sale. And that if we could get some of those rebates to the patients, it could save more than $800 a year for a patient without increasing their premiums just 1%. But why we oppose House File 4 today are three brief reasons, but important ones in that price controls, which this bill truly is, will limit access to needed medicines. Insurers are the ones that determine the ultimate price that the patients pay, and price controls on patented products are also um, problematic. For It'll limit newer treatments for patients. I can go into that more, but the second point we oppose, um, HF4, is that price controls on patented products are, on, are con unconstitutional. We do not object to state laws restricting price increases, but federal patent law preempts any provision that interferes with pricing on patented drugs. Minnesota language here interferes with the manufacturer's ability to price products, and the Federal Circuit Court did strike down D.C. legislation prohibiting any potential drugs from being sold. Also, a Maryland law in 2018 was deemed unconstitutional under up, the Dormant please. Commerce Clause. And then finally, um, we'd like to see that, that we know that price controls will jeopardize rebates. We've heard that from the CBO. We have $166 billion in rebates every year, um, $537 million, which go, come to Minnesota. We want to work with you all on policy solutions. This just is not the right vehicle. Thank you, Ms. Lambert. Okay, uh, questions. Representative Halverson, did you need to bring somebody back to the table? Um, I don't think I do. I really wanted to address the committee um, uh, based on some of the testimony I heard. I was actually really moved by um, as, uh, here is McArdle's um, testimony that we have another drug that has um, priced people out of being able to uh, uh, get a drug that's necessary to live their lives. Um, we uh, listened to testimony last night on the insulin bill and, or listened to testimony. We debated it and debated it and debated it. And um, Everybody said, what are we going to do about all the other drugs? This is what we're going to do about all the other drugs. And frankly, that was all I was going to say until I heard um, the testimony from pharma. And when I heard uh, pharma saying that, they were, uh, that it is the patient's fault that drugs are too expensive, I have to say something, that it's the patient's fault that patients are not um, using their drugs as prescribed. Patients consistently come to me and come to everyone around this table and say that they are not using their drugs as prescribed because they need to pay for a roof over their head and they need to pay for food for their kids and because their drug prices are too expensive. 
I also heard the pharmaceutical companies blaming the insurance companies uh, for the high price of prescription drugs. There's no doubt that the pricing scheme for um, healthcare is complex, but I will tell you this. One of the number one drivers of premium increases in this state and around the country are the increasing prices of prescription drugs. We need the pharmaceutical companies to stop gouging patients because people can't afford their premiums and if they're uninsured, they can't afford their drugs. And that means that we lose lives and we lose health and we lose productivity in this country. I will not abide anyone blaming patients for the high price of prescription drugs. Thank you, Representative Halverson. Representative Lash. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. And thank you, Representative Halverson. Uh, you know, when I, when I, even Dr. Shonarma, I will tell you, and everyone else on the task force, when we had our press conference last week, they had a chart up there, okay, and it had a lot of lines on the chart with the reasons for why uh, pharmaceutical prices have gotten so ridiculously high. And what they stressed in the press conference was that this is a very complicated system, and everyone plays a part in it, okay, insurance companies, uh, PBMs, manufacturers, uh, et cetera. Um, but I will say that uh, it, it is complicated, and, and yes, I, I agree that, that blaming the patients is probably bad form, uh, Representative Halverson. Um, I was a prosecutor for 15 years, and I often encountered situations where there were multiple people who were being looked at to be charged, uh, and they were all blaming each other, okay? Sometimes it was the, the wouldn't me defense, okay? I got that a lot. So as a prosecutor and trying to sift through that, who really was the one to blame, guess who I looked at first? The person who profited the most. And I can tell you that it wasn't 100% of the time that that was the most guilty party, but damn near 100%. So I don't envy the, the farmer reps that come up here and has, have to testify. You know, it's a tough job, but come on. We all know where the problem is. So I just wanted to say that, Madam Chair. All right, um, one quick question from Representative Noor and then we're gonna vote on the bill. Representative Noor. I'll keep it uh, brief, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Lesh, um, don't wanna go back to the whole discussion uh, we've had from many Minnesotans, uh, how uh, prescription drugs have gone from small to almost uh, thousands and thousands of uh, percentage higher than what it used to be. So the question that I keep on hearing is the, that this is unconstitutional that individuals don't have the right of action to have corrective process when they are being charged and overcharged for prescription drugs that they used to afford. Now they can no longer afford their lives. Can you comment on that? Sure, absolutely. Of flesh. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members, Pharma commented on two provisions, uh, including DC and the Maryland law. The Maryland law was struck down by the Fourth Circuit, so it's illegal in the Fourth Circuit. <clears throat> We don't live in the Fourth Circuit, okay? We live in the Eighth Circuit, for one, okay? So it's, it's perfectly fine here right now. But second, we drafted our law different from the Maryland law to specifically apply to uh, what the Assistant Attorney General stated, which was applies to, to uh, pharma that sales that occur in Minnesota. Uh, so it absolutely should not violate the Dormant Commerce Clause. And I'm not going into the Dormant Commerce Clause right now because you'd all fall asleep. Uh, but um, suffice it to say that our bill is constitutional. Thank you, Representative Noor. All right, thank you, Representative Noor. Anything further? Okay, so, uh, well, uh, Representative Munson, I'm sorry, I think you missed the hearing and uh, I'm not gonna entertain more questions about it because uh, we're kind of concluding now and moving on to the next mm -hmm. bill. Um, so uh, the chair renews her motion that House File 4, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The motion prevails, and the bill is on its way. Thank you, Representative Lash. Okay. All right, next we are taking up House File 1246, Representative Morrison. And again, members, this is a bill that was heard and passed out of this committee. There is an amendment which we will be discussing. There is a somewhat modified fiscal note situation since this <coughs> bill uh, was not enacted last year. And so we'll be discussing that. But 
I'm hoping that we're not going to rehash the entire issue because we did that. And so welcome to the committee, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and so the chair will move House File 1246 <coughs> to be re-referred to Ways and Means. And we have, let's see, what do we have here for a, that's the wrong one. It's one second here. Here we go. So there is a DE3 amendment, and Representative Morrison, if you, that's, that is your amendment, I assume? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, and so if you could just give us a brief explanation of the DE3, if you, if you would, or if you'd rather staff do that, that'd be fine too, but before we vote on the amendment. Uh, I was just going to do kind of a general quick overview of the bill, including the DE3. Okay, so okay. Um, the chair will move the DE3 amendment to put the bill in the form in which the author would like to have it discussed. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The motion prevails. So we now have the correct version of the bill before us, and the floor is yours, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Uh, House File 1246 is a bill to provide more transparency and information on the reasons for the ever-increasing drug price uh, crisis that we have. It's modeled after existing laws in the states of Oregon, California, and Nevada. Since last session, other states, including Texas and Maine, have passed similar bills. The bill addresses drugs in three different areas, existing drugs in the market, new drugs, and drugs acquired by another company. In each of these areas, thresholds are created that would dictate when a manufacturer would need to report on the information outlined in the bill to MDH. A manufacturer will only need to submit a report to MDH if they choose to raise the price of their drugs over these thresholds. Existing and acquired drugs, um, a drug over, any drug over $100 for a 30-day supplier for a course of treatment lasting less than 30 days. And for brand name drugs, where there's an increase of 10% or greater in the price over the previous 12-month period, or an increase of 16% or greater in the price over the previous 24-month period. And for generic drugs, where there's an increase of 50% or greater in the price over the previous 12-month period. For new drugs, any drug over the threshold established by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for specialty <laughs> drugs in the Medicare Part D program which is currently $670. Fines are listed in the bill in case the manufacturer does not comply. MDH is tax tasked with collecting any information that's submitted from a manufacturer. MDH will then post any information that's not marked as a trade secret by the manufacturer. MDH will also submit a report to the legislature <coughs> on the operation of the program annually beginning in 2022. The bill has gone through significant changes since introduction to help address the concerns from opponents and to align this bill as closely as possible to other states with existing laws to help manufacturers comply with the law. And I think that Judy Cook, representing generics earlier, stated that the generics are now neutral on the bill. All right, okay, Representative Morrison, could you just... Um let us, if you could just kind of remind us the path this bill has traveled since last session. It was part of our omnibus bill. It did not make it through at the end. And uh, can you just talk a little bit about what happened and what's happened since? Yeah, and can, can you just, I'm not, I'm not asking you to talk about the money part of it. We're going to ask Doug Berg to explain that. Sure. But if you could just sort of explain what's happened. Sure. I mean, I know there was, in other words, I, there was significant work done. Yes. You know, this was, there was, this did not get through in the final bill last year. Um, there was disagreement at the end. And then you and other people worked on this, and there's been a lot of engagement I mean, you did say that some stakeholders have now come to the table and so on, but um, I'm kind of thinking about the other body. Is this a consensus? Ver Let me just be clear what my question is. Is this a consensus <laughs> bill with the Senate, or is there still a difference? And is there, you know, what's the status with that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, a significant amount of work has been done. There's a really broad coalition of stakeholders who are supporters of this bill. It, it was lost in conference committee at the end after going through both the House and the Senate. Uh, we've had work groups. Um, Senator Rosen, who's the Senate author, and I have gotten together many times, and we have really uh, crafted a bill that is satisfactory to 
almost all players um, and the House and the Senate and the, the bills do align. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then, Mr. Berg, could you explain? We have two fiscal notes and uh, yeah. let us know what's happening here. Madam <laughs> Chair, there is a fiscal note in your packet, but there also members should have a one page, very simple spreadsheet that's labeled House File 1246 Drug Price Transparency Cost Versus Appropriation. And I think it'll be easier to look at this, uh, the fiscal note in this case isn't as instructive as it would be because we have a little bit of an unusual situation. Last year, the money to do this was appropriated in the, uh, the Omnibus Human Services Appropriation Bill, but the language at the very end, the House and Senate could not reach agreement on the enacting language. So the money has been appropriated, it's just the language telling the department how to proceed that is at issue. And if you look at this short sheet and you see the top line, line one, that's the amount of money that was appropriated last year. Those are the numbers from last year's fiscal note. Uh, and you'll see that for 2021, a total of 1,620,000 was appropriated and we uh, book tales of 1.4 million. State statute 16A.28 allows every agency to carry forward non-grant operating funds from the first year to the second year. So the health department has the total 1.62 million to work with. If you look at line three, that is the fiscal note. It says fiscal note 9037, which was before the uh, when the amendment was just done, but it is uh, now, uh, fiscal note 1246-3A, the amendment that was just adopted. And you'll see it moves it forward. The first year, of course, there isn't any money needed because that year has passed. There's a total of 965,000 as assumed. Nothing is different here except that the health department had to update their assumptions for salary costs and indirect costs that are creep year to year. And so their costs go up slightly in 21 and in the tails, but it's the same work. So if you look in aggregate, they have 1.62 million in 2021 to do work that they estimate will cost $965,000. So we, uh, and in the tails, uh, there is a, they estimate costs 166,000 higher than we booked, but those are not appropriations, they're just base amounts. So. This language will tell the department to go forward with money they already have. At some point, it's likely when there are budget targets for committees, we will likely adjust the appropriation <coughs> to recoup the extra money and adjust the tails. But today, all that needs to happen is for the department to have enabling legislation to tell them what to do with the money they already have. So thank you, Mr. Berg. And um, so we are in the unusual situation. You should all be so lucky <laughs> to have a bill where the money's already appropriated and you're just telling the agency what to do with the money. Um, so that's represent Representative Morrison's enviable position today. Are there questions about the fiscal note or, or about the bill? All right, uh, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for all your work on this bill. I am a proponent and look forward to it continuing to um, come together with the Senate. But can you just remind us how the bill takes into consideration the difference between the, the list price and the net price of a drug? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I'm going to have to jog my memory um, on that question. And maybe I could phone a friend. Mm. Sure. Who do you need? <laughs> Mr. Chan, can you help me out? <coughs> Mr. Chan. Uh, so, Mr. Chair and members, I, I think the, the distinctions would be made by the information that's being reported for, um, you know, when, when the drug meets a certain price price threshold, uh, you know, th then there's language about the, the, the direct costs, the introductory price, the actual wholesale price of the drug, which is, and um, 
there's, there's some also measures of, of, of profit. Representative Haley. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I'm happy to take it offline. I think the complexity that we've all stated in the, the supply chain of drugs, um, it's important for me to understand in this bill, kind of at the end of the day, what price are we monitoring here? So we can talk about it at a different time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Representative Schultz. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Liebling. On line um, 2.13, price means the wholesale acquisition cost. Thank you for that. Um, and, um, you know, I neglected to uh, call for witnesses, which we do have some folks who, I think Judy Cook already testified. I don't know if she wanted to come down again. Um, Sharon Lamberton wanted to talk on this bill also. And then, or Representative Munson, do you, you have the next question. Do you want to ask your question first or after Ms. Lamberton? Uh, Madam Chair, actually, I could ask it now, and maybe if the others that are coming to testify would like to just give a few words, that would be helpful. Okay, go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Morrison, and I'm, I was a co-author on your bill. Um, I think maybe you approached me last year and said, hey, you're the price transparency guy. You want on? I said, yeah, let's do it. And then I read, I read more details on the bill and had a deeper thought and, and took my name off the bill. Um, I'm conflicted on this because um, I believe price transparency is, and, and kind of the right to shop is so important in reducing the cost of prescription drugs. But uh, one of the things that this bill I don't believe addresses, and maybe you can answer this, is when we talk about the pricing that has to be reported on the sales and distribution costs, is it only within the United States? Or does it include the, the, the international sales where a drug is patented here and they're selling it at basically a loss overseas because of price controls, and then uh, can they include those losses that they have to sell it for overseas as part of their, of, of their costs to sell it here? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. This uh, applies to the state of Minnesota. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Ms. Lamberton. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I want to just jump right into the question about price. Okay, and for if you the... could just say your name again yes. for the record. Sorry, Sorry. we're on a different bill. <laughs> My name is Sharon Lamberton. I'm with Pharma, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. I'd love to just jump into one of the reasons why we oppose House File 1246 is just because the, of the fact that pri the net price growth and discounts that are given to insurers um, and to the PBMs are not accounted for in this legislation because WAC, the wholesale acquisition cost, is what is used to look at determining price from manufacturer to wholesalers, wholesalers to pharmacies. Um, that's not what um, the patient actually pays. We believe this legislation is overly burdensome and expensive for uh, Minnesota, and it really does nothing to help the patient as far as getting that rebate dollar to the patient at the point of sale. So we would recommend that in because this legislation has unnecessary reporting, it can tend to misinform the patient. It could potentially create a gray market where secondary distributors are entering the pharmaceutical supply chain, um, trying to resell them to each other before they're ultimately sold to a facility. And then finally, we would like to look at um, the current litigation that's out there in Oregon and, and Washington on these types of uh, bills that really looks at violating the Commerce Clause. The solutions we'd rather focus on instead of this legislation is passing on the rebates to the patients, ensuring that health plans could um, offer a fixed and a fixed copay, maybe even a no deductible or coinsurance. Um, this bill is not going to lower patients' costs, and that's the reason why we oppose. Okay, hey, thank you. And um, Representative Morrison, did you want to respond? I, I must say the term gray market makes me want to say that's what we have now. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pretty gray market. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, Re Representative Morrison? Uh, Madam Chair, members, I, I just, I guess I would say there's no silver bullet to solving the problem of excessively high prescription drug prices. I do think it's instructive that at this point the only actor that is opposed to this bill is the pharmaceutical industry. Um, this bill will provide us with important information how pharmaceutical companies come to the prices that they do as we try to unpack what is going on with the cost of prescription drugs. This will not solve the problem, but this is a tool that we can use to help to understand it better. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Representative Munson, I, you got mm -hmm. put back on the list. Is it something different, new and different? Um, no, Madam okay. Chair, it's actually just to follow up on that, I okay. mean, previous question. So looking through the bill, there is nothing that specifies that it has to be about pricing and all of these numbers you're talking about specific to the state of Minnesota and drugs that are, you know, they, there isn't a drug made that is sold just in Minnesota. It's sold all across this country and all around the world. And the pricing of which is different everywhere. And so if you're looking for the pricing, you know, these average costs, um, it doesn't say specific to Minnesota, and especially when we talk about um, the, their, their losses that could be selling it for a loss overseas. So uh, I don't see that information in the bill, and if, you, if it is, could you point me to it? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Munson, thanks for your comments. Uh, I mean, this is Minnesota law, so I, I'm not sure if I can point exactly into the bill what you're looking for. Um, and it, it, where it would say that it was the costs uh, incurred in Minnesota or by the manufacturer for the sales in Minnesota, there, there isn't anything that restricts the, the pricing to Minnesota. Um, and that, I guess maybe we could ask research, House Research if they mm -hmm. could weigh in on, on why the cost in Canada aren't it's average here or across the entire country. Either. Mr. John. Uh, Ms. Madam Chair and Representative Munson, um, I, I think that the, the bill, you're, you're right, it does not refer to Minnesota prices or the prices sold in Minnesota. That is, you know, perhaps a clarification that could be made if that's something the author would like, like to do. Um, the, when you talk about prices for other countries, I, I would just note that one of the things that would, would be reported for brand name drugs and Nine three point one five. It's the ten highest prices paid for drugs sold, you know, in any country other than the United States. So there's some, some distinction from the international price. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So uh, Representative Halverson, and then uh, and then Representative Schultz, and then we're going to vote on the bill. Representative Halverson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, I, um, Representative Morrison mentioned it, but we do have in our packets a list of all the folks who are in favor of this bill. And any author, bill author, this is your dream as a bill author, I think. Congratulations, Representative Morrison, to get this diverse <laughs> number of stakeholders to come together and get agreement. I think it really speaks to um, how this issue is affecting everybody in the state of Minnesota. And just briefly to respond to, to again, to what we heard from Pharma, um, shifting uh, responsibility to um, we just have to cap copays and and then everybody will be able to get their drugs. This is not the problem. That is a shifting of where the money goes, putting more pressure on our premiums, um, putting, um, you know, while protecting uh, the dollars that are going into uh, uh, f the pockets of pharma. Um, and uh, the fact that um, this might create a gray market or a black market, we're there. Go check out your emails. Go go look at Facebook. How many GoFundMe's are you guys donating to or seeing from your high school friends on your Facebook page? Um, we've got people who are, are driving insulin to, to people who are running out. Um, we're there. <laughs> this is a crisis, and um, everybody on this list has realized it, and uh, super proud of everybody for coming together and getting this done. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Chair Liebling. So I guess um, the issue of, of collecting information on the costs, um, the author may want to just consider a little bit more clarification, because I, I think you do want to capture global costs um, for the company to see what their total profit is. So um, you might want to add costs in the U.S. and um, costs outside the U.S. Okay. Representative Morrison? Madam Chair, Representative Schultz, I will consult with MDH. I'm sure they will welcome that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the chair re renews your motion that House File 1246, as amended, be re-referred to Ways and Means. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <laughs> the motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, we're going to move now to House File 1257, Representative Cantrell. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Cantrell. Um, I wonder if, um, you know, we, we have on the, on the, the uh, agenda also House File 288, which we have here just for an informational hearing. That is Representative Mason. Is she in the room? Um, I do not see her, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay, because we put that on with this one because they're pretty closely related. So, um, but let's just go ahead. When she gets here, um, we'll, we'll take up hers separately and we'll just see what's the same and different. Okay, so go ahead, Representative Cantrell. I assume you want to move your bill. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. And the motion here is to move the bill, uh, to recommend the bill to move to Ways and Means. And oh. then from there, it goes to state government finance. That is my motion, Madam Chair. Okay. And then there is a DE1 amendment. And Representative Cantrell, is that yours? And do you want to move it? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, that is mine. It is um, the, the amendment from last year. Um, just made a couple changes on the advice of DHS. Um, very, uh, very similar to the original version. But yes, I'd like to move okay. the Okay, let's adopt that then. And then we can uh, discuss this as it's amended. So Representative Cantrell moves the DE1 to put the bill in the form in which he'd like to discuss it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion prevails. So Representative Cantrell, go ahead and let us know. Um, and again, this was um, discussed last year, and so we're mostly going to um, do the changes. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, it's my honor to bring before you House File 1257, a bill that we presented last year um, that would prohibit, I think, with reasonable, uh, reasonable um, notice and off-ramps, uh, mid-year formulary changes. These changes uh, have been known to destabilize the continuity of patient health care. Uh, and I am uh, honored to have uh, Representative Baker and, and Representative <laughs> Hamilton um, on the bill as well, as well as yourself, Madam Chair, and some of the other members of our, of our committee, um, because ultimately when patients sign up for a health plan, especially if they have a complex and chronic health condition, they should know that when they are promised that they're going to be able to get maybe the one drug that can potentially slow the progression of, of their chronic health condition, that that care isn't that that care isn't going to be pulled out from under them, and this is what happens so frequently today to patients with epilepsy, patients with uh, depression, anxiety, uh, patients with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, and so today, I, I have a couple of testifiers, and we have Representative Mason here as well, Madam Chair. So I'm not sure. Uh, would you like uh, Representative Mason to explain her bill a little bit first, or? Well, um, I yeah, Representative Mason, welcome to the committee. <laughs> So we're giving House File 288 an informational hearing today, and because it's closely related to Representative Cantrell's bill, House File 1257. So uh, maybe um, uh, what we wanted to do was just sort of highlight how it's the same or different, because I, as I understand, it's kind of included, or some of it is included within Representative Cantrell's bill. So. Do you want to just address that briefly, and then we'll move forward with his testifiers? Okay. I don't know if you got a chance to hear his presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. House File 288 is part of the uh, bills that were being put forward for the insulin, so my bill does deal strictly with the, uh, it, it's a prevention for insurance companies to change the formularies or the equipment during the life of the contract. So that would, so the difference would be that mine, I think, includes equipment uh, where uh, Representative Cantrell's does not, but his includes all things. Mine is just relevant to the insulin. Okay, so there's a lot of overlap in the Venn diagram, mm -hmm. and but not complete overlap. So Representative Mason's bill includes uh, equipment and supplies needed for diabetes management. Exactly. And uh, but the only drug in there, or the only drugs are insulin, insulin drugs. Exactly. And then Representative Cantrell's bill is all pharmaceuticals, but not the equipment and supplies. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So um, shall we move to testifiers then? Uh, yes, please, Madam Chair. All right. So welcome to the committee, Dr. Krishlow. 
if you could say your name for the record, please. Yes, Madam. I am Madam Chair. I am Dr. Renee Critchlow. And Madam Chair and members, I am not known for my brevity, so I'm going to stick to the script. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair and members, I am Renee Critchlow, a family physician practicing at Broadway Family Medicine Clinic. I'm the president of the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. Today I'm here representing the MAFP and the Minnesota Medical Association, the MMA, in a strong support for HF 1257. As a physician, my first goal is to work with my patients to determine what medications are needed for their treatment. As a family physician, I have many patients who have multiple chronic conditions where treatments can last for many years. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, <coughs> hypertension, asthma, mental illness, and more. For these patients, it is critical we find and, find and maintain the right treatment so that their condition does not worsen. As a physician, there's nothing more infuriating then we, I have a patient who is well stabilized on a medication that is working for her and to hear the health plan or the PBM changes its formulary in the mid-year, resulting in my patient not getting the medication that has worked for them. As many of you may know, children with asthma are very often on two very important inhaler medications, their rescue inhaler, which they use when they absolutely need it, and their controller medication, which they use on a daily basis to prevent the need for rescue. The rescue inhaler is something that I've always seen pretty well covered for general. The controller inhaler, so often I've seen February is the month where I admit more children to the hospital because their, uh, the formula was changed and the inhaled controller medication that they were taking, that they were well stable on, on for years, is no longer available to them. This is not appropriate, this is not good, and this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, why should a health plan or PBM be able to force my patients to change from drugs that have been working for them? My patients can't change the insurance plan during the year, yet the insurance can change the contract that they engage with. For many conditions, changing from one drug to another in the same drug class can work fine. But for certain conditions like mental illness, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, and others, changing medication mid-treatment can put the patient at severe risk. You will hear these changes are done in the name of saving costs. But if the patient cannot get their inhaler in a timely manner and ends up in the emergency room, who saved cost? If the patient cannot get their antidepressant that works for them and they end up in an institution, who's saving cost? If they, HF 1257 does not prohibit PBMs from changing their formularies throughout the year. They can always add new drugs when they believe it's a benefit. They can always add new generic when they come available. They can always add new drugs that may be cost effective for the patient but the bill will prohibit its forcing of a patient to switch midstream. They have a therapy that works for them that they started when they chose that contract. Until the end of the patient's enrollment, that drug should not change. You also need to know the damage and the cost the formulator changes have as administrative barriers on physicians and other prescribers. In our clinic alone, we have one person whose sole job is to sit on the phone for hours trying to get medications for our patients, appealing with insurance who have made medical decisions by someone who has never seen the patient. While we are successful many times in getting the appeals, care is delayed for the patient and administrative costs and hassle are being added. Our patient lives are at stake. Delayed care can be deadly care. I ask you to support HF 1257. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're going to hold questions <coughs> until the end of the testimony, so because we only have about a little over 15 minutes left in this hearing, um, and we're going to vote on the bill before the end. So, uh, or is Abner Holden <coughs> representative, but not <laughs> that kind? <laughs> Welcome Thank to the you, committee, Madam Chair. Um, Sue Abner Holden, uh, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota National Alliance on Mental Illness, and I just want to really. Um, say how difficult it is when you have a loved one living with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, to find the right medication. It can often take years. It took years in my own family. Um, and so when we and others go to select our health plans for that year, we look very carefully at that formulary to make sure that the medication that has finally worked is on that list. And so then when it changes mid-year, even though you have a contract, it really can wreak havoc. Um, the symptoms can return. It can really lead to someone going into crisis, experiencing psychosis again, 
feeling suicidal, not being able to function at work or at home. Um, and so it really, it really puts people and families at great risk. And so I would, just, I would urge you to make sure that we're not asking for something out of the ordinary. We have a contract with the health plan, and they should hold that same contract back to us so that those medications don't change. Um, it, you know, I have a lot of depression and anxiety in my own family, and um, I think I would lay down in front of a train before anyone changed that medication, mm -hmm. um, because once it finally works, you want to hang on to that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. After Holden. Dan Andreessen. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. I appreciate Representative Cantrell and uh, supporters of the bill willing to chat with us about the bill. Uh, we do still have concerns, and I know that you know we, we spoke about those concerns last year um, and the challenge that it is when we prohibit a plan from being able to make changes to a drug formulary. It really hampers our ability to manage costs. And earlier in committee, we talked quite a bit about uh, prescription drug costs and how they've been rising and how they rise at the first of the year. And this often happens after the formulary is set. And so when these costs come our way, we have to figure out a way to manage those costs. Um, we also continue to have concerns with the language um, that it's not applied equally to state public programs. The language in the bill allows DHS to make formulary changes four times a year. And we understand the goal of the bill is to provide continuity of care, uh, but having a different standard for those in public programs compared to those in the commercial market doesn't seem to uniformly accomplish this, obje this objective. Uh, as it's currently written, an MA enrollee could be forced to be a, uh, do a switch four times a year. And on this issue, uh, one item I'd like to raise is regarding the fiscal impact of the bill. Um, last session, uh, DHS lowered their projected costs, but they were allowed to do four switches a year. And the, the fiscal note that was, was printed out is dated, I think, in April. Um, and since that time, DHS's management of the drug benefit uh, public programs has changed um, on July 1st when they required all MCOs to adhere to a new preferred drug list. And in their fiscal assumptions, it doesn't look like they make a mention of uh, the preferred drug list. Um, so we don't know how this interacts with this new formula. Um, and since its inception, we've seen DHS make frequent changes uh, to their preferred drug list. And so now the public programs are operating under a different benefit system than when this bill was before the committee last May. It might be worth looking into the preferred drug list and how it interacts with the bill um, and more broadly how it impacts the state. Uh, so we urge the committee to Consider the financial trade-offs associated with this proposal and um, the impacts of DHS. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, Representative Beerman. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Representative Cantrell, for bringing the bill forward. I just had a question on the length of the time. I know you say it's one year, they, that they can't bring a new, new product or d discontinue a product within their drug formulary year. What's the magic of one year and is that long enough? I mean, if a drug is working for a patient and that drug is not discontinued and they want to drop it from the formulary, you're still at the same point of losing that good drug that's working for somebody when it may be available still either in another location. And I'm just wondering how we navigate that for the best care of the patient instead of having insurance companies and PBMs maybe making that choice. Is one year long enough? So, uh, um, <coughs> Representative Beerman, I mean, I think, Representative Cantrell, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, this is because people select a plan for a year. And you're selecting a plan in part based on whether that plan is going to meet your needs. So I think the one year is that after that year, you, if they dropped your drug, you go and find a plan that includes that drug on their formulary. Is that R Representative Cantrell? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, that is uh, correct. And uh, on lines um, 1.22 through uh, 1 point, or uh, excuse me, 2.2, um, it, it does indicate that um, Health plans do have to give a, a 30 day notice if they're planning on, on doing something else um, prior to uh, the, the uh, annual renewal. 
um, so that patients will have the opportunity to to try and shop around, try and find a health plan that actually will cover their their drug um, if uh, if one that uh, they have previously been on or, or are currently on um, covers a drug but says, yeah, we're not going to do that next year. Um, so I, I absolutely, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bierman, find your point uh, well taken. You know, I think that no matter what, um, uh, private entities should not be determining the continuity of care for patients. Um, and it's unfortunate that this is the system we have, but I think that this is a good starting point to ensure that uh, people are protected. Representative Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Kentrell. And, and I, I think the, this is a great starting point. There's a lot of great starting points that we're getting to in a lot of different areas, and I appreciate you for bringing the, the bill forward. And that's just an area where I'm running into constituents who have this issue all the time where their, their drug is dropped. But it's dropped not because of the choice of the doctor that it's not available. It's just suddenly not allowed on the formulary, not for that customer in that year. So this will help them get to that next year, perhaps. And then they have to seek out a new plan, I guess. That's a little complicated way of doing things, but I guess we're all used to the complication of our health care system right now. Right. We should never get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the previous testifier said something that I found extremely concerning about the cost. And I'm sure he's talking about the cost to the insurance companies. But the people that have diabetes and many of these other situations, I mean, they have to search to make sure that they have coverage that is going to meet their needs. And when that is changed in the middle of a contract, that means they have to start all over again. That to me is un terribly unfair. And I, I just don't understand how anybody can get away with changing in the middle of a contract. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative Halverson, then Grunhaig. I'll be very brief, uh, Madam Chair, and I, because I don't think that this question could get answered in this hearing, but I really um, want all the stakeholders to think about this. And that is when we as patients um, look at the way these formulary descriptions are made to save costs, um, very often they don't appear to save costs from the outside. Um, I think the physician uh, mentioned about, you know, increased hospitalizations. Um, Ms. Abderholden mentioned that, you know, you uh, run a great risk of having to go down a very long road to get stabilized on medications if you're stable on a, a mental health medication. And in, in my own family, I have seen the toggle back and forth between we're not going to cover the brand name, we're only going to cover the generic, and now we're only going to cover the brand name, we're not going to cover the generic, um, that toggle back and forth with all that complex behind the scenes that's happening. And so um, the notion that this is saving health care costs um, it doesn't look like it's saving health care costs from, from uh, the patient point of view because it's, you know, it could put somebody in the hospital or um, this, you know, we, we were really taught well as consumers to, uh, you know, find cheap prescrip prescription drug alternatives like um, generics and to utilize the generic market and, and that that was going to save us on health on, uh, healthcare costs. And, and so all the things that we were taught to do as consumers, um, uh, are these formulary changes uh, seem to be counterintuitive to the things that we're taught as consumers. And so that is a, a question we need to deep more deeply into to understand this. So that is my question. All right. How does this possibly save costs? <laughs> so that's my question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Halverson. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I could answer that question. <laughs> Just kidding. No, hey, thanks for bringing this bill forward. We need to vet this area. I, I, I was wondering if uh, Mr. Andreessen could come back to the testifying table. I'll move this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've sold uh, health insurance since 1978. I, I sell the Part D drug plans. I sell individual health insurance plans. So I've seen a lot of changes. I was only 10 years old when I started selling, but <laughs> the, uh, that's a little bit of a stretch. But, um, you know, and I also have independent drug stores in my district. I'm a rural district, 18B, McLeod, Sibley County. I just lost another independent drug store out in my district, closed up, okay? I have another independent drug store uh, that's privately owned, and she used to work for PBM, okay? Uh, uh, 
a pharmacy benefit manager. And she's saying that they're manipulating, this is the allegation, okay, and I appreciate it if you respond to it. She's saying they're manipulating the formulary drugs, not so much what's in the patient's best interest, but based on the amount of discounts they can get from, from the pharmaceutical company. And the result is, in some cases, she's being forced to sell prescription drugs at a loss, okay? She actually loses money. Her comment to me has been, uh, you know, in two to three years, I'm going to be out of business, all right? So we're social, in the allegation is we're social engineering our independent small drug stores, especially in the rural area, right out of business. If I'm a patient and I need a life-saving drug on a weekend, and I, you know, for whatever reason, and I don't have it filled, if that local drugstore isn't, if somebody who lives in the area who can run down to the drugstore, fill that for me, I'm likely to die before a PBM responds, okay? Um, Rep Representative Grunhagen, he's with the Council of Health Plants. He's not with pharmacists, so I just oh. want to make sure you understand. Well, I hope you can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Representative Grunhagen, we do have Dr. Schaumelmeyer here, and he might, I don't know if he might be able, I don't know what the question is. Are you trying is. to help me out? <laughs> I, I am, because we're, because we're running out of time, yeah. Representative Grunhagen. So I if, I, I I'd love to, out. this is a really important question that yep. we yep. all share. Okay. So if Dr. Schaumelmeyer, could you, if you could kind of state the question. Yep, I real, get just, to it and then. Right now. We'll know who should answer. I was just setting the table, okay? Here he comes. Hi, Dr. Schallmeyer. Um, so I, I assume you follow most of what I said. I'm not going to repeat it, right? Thank you. I understood the background you described, and I believe most of that happens in the market. Yeah. So my question is, then, you know, I can understand why these bills are being brought forward because, you know, the exhaust of all this switching around on the formula in the middle of the year is that people are being put on, on prescriptions that don't work as well and in some cases are more expensive and the PBMs are pocketing the difference and in some cases forcing local drug stores to sell at a loss. Mm -hmm. Is this bill going to help that situation or? Thank you. Uh, I Dr. got to it. Dr. Sean Meyer, I mean, there is... Honestly, we could spend hours talking about this, yeah. but Dr. Schamelmeyer, can you address that issue? Thank, thank you. you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative, for a, a very good question. Um, <laughs> I think this bill will help that situation. Essentially, what we have is uh, physic patients, physicians, pharmacists, frustrated with all these switch to this, switch to that, uh -huh. and even, I I'm not here to defend or support either the, the PBMs, but the PBMs also are trying to make the market work by if this price is too much, I'll switch to this drug and try to lower the price, and they may or may not pass it on to the patient. So we have everybody in the market trying to do things. Markets don't work if you don't say no. And, but then that creates complications for patients, and it creates switching formularies. And I don't want a formulary that I choose that plan, and I want this formulary, and I expect to have this drug for the whole year, and then find out six months later that it disappeared and I can't get it anymore, that's not good either. So I think this bill, along with the House Bill 4 that we heard earlier, will help address this. This bill alone won't solve it. Other bills alone won't solve it. It really takes a constellation of efforts here to solve this problem. And Dr. Stondelmeyer, when you said markets don't work if you don't say no, I saw some puzzled looks. Could you explain what you meant by that? Well, yes, if, if someone offers a product in the marketplace and you keep paying the price, that person will argue, well, you voluntarily chose to pay that. Uh, consumers, though, don't voluntarily choose to pay the price of the drug. If it's about your life and death, you probably don't have a choice. I mean, how many, uh, imagine for a moment if you or your grandfather had a heart attack. He's in the emergency room uh, getting his heart attack attended to. You expect that your grandfather's going to sit up and say, but wait, how much does this cost? And is there another emergency room that costs less? We don't make decisions in healthcare rationally when it's about life and death. And some of these drugs, as we've heard from patients, are about life and death. So we aren't making rational economic decisions in the market because of the nature of the product that's being bought. And then 
we heard about the gray markets. This market is very gray. It's, it's very dim. It's hard to see into any of it. Mm -hmm. And so we need transparency. We need accountability for prices. And we need stability in what's available to take care of our health. All right. Thank you very much. We're almost out of time, Representative Grunhagen, and we are going to vote on this bill. So, okay. you know what, I would suggest that you get together with Dr. Schondelmeyer if he has time and maybe we could take it offline. All right. So, um, <coughs> and, sir? Okay. And also, uh, Dr. Weiberg is here, too. I'm sure he can answer some of these questions as well. So, um, uh, Dr. Representative Cantrell is going to renew his motion that House File 1257, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The motion prevails. Thank you. Thank and, you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Representative Mason, for coming in and helping us out here. Thank you to all the testifiers, and um, we will we will have another day on pharmaceuticals. This is not the end. Thank you. We are adjourned.